Hi, everyone. Hi, how's it going? Thank you for joining us. We're going to get started. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you to our panelists. I'm going to start by asking them to each briefly introduce themselves, um, and then we'll get we'll get into it. Yes. Is this? I can never tell if these are. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. I'm Chris. Um, so introduce ourselves. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Chris Wiley, um, and I uh, currently work as the global director of research for H and M Group which is both H&M the brand and then all of the other brands uh, that we own, so costs and other stories and all that. Um, and uh, people also might have known me for um, last year, I was also a whistleblower um, with Cambridge Analytica scandal and whatnot. Um, so I spend a lot of time uh, talking about the ethics of AI and the ethics of data. Um, and my uh, new role at H&M is to look at how can we use um, artificial intelligence, data research, and insight to better understand um, the diversity of our customers around the world? We're in 72 markets. Um, and also tackle some of the really tough challenges that the industry has. So that's like, you know, sustainability and you know, really starting to understand um, how can we optimize our supply chain so we can reduce waste, actually start figuring out how we can involve uh, customers and this conversation and understanding about sustainability, also tackling you know the fact that fashion has an issue with you know understanding different kinds of people and embracing and celebrating those kinds of people, and we can use research and data to help um, you know at least from our brand's uh, perspective uh, to better understand the diversity of the global fashion market. Um, so yeah, You're spoiling I mean, the rest of our talk. So sorry, you're, we're going to get into it. Great, okay. cool, <laughs> sorry, hi. No, I appreciate it. Michael, if you give us a full life history, we'll be here forever, uh, okay. it'll be very I, exciting. I, I'll start sorry. with, uh, Tell I us made, what my, you've been doing at I made my first picture with a computer in 1969, so that's going back some time. Um, I'm the executive director of the FIT in 4D Tech Lab, and the mission of the lab is to engage faculty and students solving industry problems with design and technology. And that kind of frames uh, a lot of the projects we've done in the lab over the past couple of years. Chris? Um, Chris Bevins, and uh, I have my own tailored sportswear uh, brand, men, men's and women's, called Dime. Um, I was a Nike creative director for some years in Beaverton, Oregon. Um, and I'm really excited to be here and talk about my adventures and building a brand. Great. So our theme today is jobs of tomorrow. Um, obviously, we all know here that fashion is changing rapidly. Um, but it's also an industry I think has been governed for a long time by what was done in the past or sort of conventional wisdom. And um, so much is changing in the way that we decide what to make, how to sell it, how to talk to people about it, how to predict how much is going to be sold and, and who's going to want it, and the companies that will really survive and thrive in this next era are the ones that are going to understand how to disrupt themselves, which I feel like is a lot of what you all just mentioned in your, even in your intro. So I think I'd like to start by asking you all about how you're using or experimenting with data and artificial intelligence to better understand what people want when they when they buy from fashion brands. What are they thinking about, um, and how can brands like cater to them better? Uh, I can jump in on that uh, just to talk about a project we did um, last year, actually, and it was a partnership with uh, between the lab and IBM to explore how artificial intelligence can improve decision making in design, manufacturing, and retail for the iconic lifestyle brand Tommy Hilfiger. And it was really interesting engagement because the students came in, the design students in particular came in with a lot of trepidation and they were bold because they still came in and their feeling was robots were going to eat their job. And they left after having spent eight weeks using AI tools to help them understand the DNA of the brand and to explore design directions to see whether they were um, on point with what was new for Tommy or has it been done by other designers. And they did this with visual material, not with words. They took drawings and other images. 
And they left the project saying, wow, that was like working with a really great assistant designer who was with me all the time. So I think that characterizes sort of the way in which you can look at AI as augmenting the process rather than replacing it. So the project was looking at images and helping the designers understand that. Can you speak a bit more about that for someone like me who sometimes even the word AI is confusing? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so the way that this project worked was that uh, IBM provided to us 600,000 images that were collected from runway shows, from social media websites uh, of runway shows around the world over a five-year period. And to that was added 15,000 images from Tommy's catalog over three years and six seasons uh, per year. So that became a database that they could then take an image and say, show me uh, who was doing something like this. And those images could be a photograph of the Eiffel Tower, it could be a picture of a flower, it could be a drawing. But what they did was they started to look and start to develop ideas and see how uh, much the images that they're using as a source aligned with trends and they could find out whether Tommy had never done something along these lines or they had been doing it every year for the entire three years that we had or a particular designer was very focused on it in a particular period of time. So you use the tools in sort of a, a somewhat natural way of, oh, I have an idea, let me see who else is doing it and it went and crawled over the database but it did it by doing um, a visual uh, assessment and it would measure the similarity against other images and then return to you a big list. And then from that, you could then continue to refine and create subsets and narrow down. The, I will say that after we delivered the final product, the chief brand officer of Tommy, um, Avery Baker, looked at one of the designs a student had done and said, well, I'd wear that and I'd sell that in my stores. So it was very clear that they really informed the student and they aligned their designs. Some, a silhouette that Tommy had never used before, but still really reflected the values. That's super interesting. And Chris Wiley, can you talk a bit about how you're using uh, AI? Yeah, I, th I think computer vision, so which is like using, building models to understand um, and, and create intuition around visual imagery is really interesting. And one of the things, one of the projects that I'm having a lot of fun with is trying to teach um, computers how to understand not just like specific uh, attributes on, on clothing, you know, cut or, you know, color or pattern or whatever, but actually um, trying to teach a computer what sexy means or like what bold means. And, if, and so if you, if you take a step back, so machine learning, I don't know how much people know about machine learning, but you can really think about it as anything, that, the, the way that a baby is going to learn and how you teach a baby how to learn something, constantly showing them and then saying what it is over and over again until they finally get it, is kind of like how you teach a computer stuff. Um, but if you think about how like difficult actually it is to describe, like could you come up with a definition of bold or a definition of sexy that is like a universal principle of sexy or bold, um, and then try to teach a computer that. Um, and it's really interesting because if you look at things like, um, for example, a woman's corset. In the um, 1850s, a woman's corset was like the epitome of sort of feminine modesty, right? Like, you know, th this is why we have the expression loose women, because, you know, loose women didn't wear corsets, because um, guys don't have time for that. But um, but if you took the same corset and put, same corset, imagine it's the, we had a time travel machine, put it, put that woman, uh, like walk down the streets of New York today wearing that corset. It's quite racy, maybe it's kinky. Maybe you'd find the same corset like in like a kink store. And so you've got literally the same woman wearing the same product, but the, because the context is different then the meaning is different. And so what's really cool about fashion is like how contextual meaning changes and actually fashion so much is about that contextual meaning. And when you apply AI to that, it, you, it, it becomes really, really hard. But it's really, really cool. And, so, and, I, and I honestly think that, that, that we will start to build um, models that will eventually start to understand these sort of discrete attributes uh, of meaning. But I think that's, that's what we have to do. It's not just literally understanding like this is a pair of trousers or this is a shirt or this is blue, but that, that this is sexy. So your goal is to 
bring that context to the company so that they can understand the products that they're making? Or how do you apply the ideas that you just said? It was just super interesting. You could go into a rabbit hole of that yeah. forever. But like, how do you apply that to so, a company that's really like in yeah, the so, um, stuff? Right now, I mean, I, I think of it as a translation issue. So if you think about um, Google Translate, for example, right? You've got, you type in English and then it comes out as French, right? And so um, you put in hello and bonjour comes out of it, right? And in that, the meaning is the same, and but you've got, you know, data form A and data form B. So now if we start thinking about fashion as, as translation, where we've got, uh, a type of product and a type of person. And there's attributes about this product and attributes about a person. And in, in order to create desire, we have to have an accurate translation between a certain attribute or feeling of a product that that conveys and the type of person who wants that feeling. And so um, not to get into the weeds about machine learning and, you know, deep learn, you know, neural networks and autoencoders and all this kind of stuff. But you can build algorithms if you're using a translation framework to start to understand that actually part of the fashion system and part of desire is like a good translation, if that makes sense. Yeah, so it's about understanding what people will want more accurately. That was like a much more succinct <laughs> way of uh, saying what I just said. <laughs> Chris, Talk done. <laughs> no, that's great. That's really interesting. I mean, it's so fascinating what you're doing, and, and I'm sure many other companies are trying to do something similar. But I, I, I think that the, 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 the fashion sector is actually way behind other sectors in terms of the integration of technology now. Um, but, but it's great that we're trying. I always like to look at the link between fashion and architecture. And if you look at some of the earlier uh, research in architecture in developing grammars that characterize style, it starts to be a really interesting new development that is roughly called um, computational creativity. And the analytic side is the machine learning, but if you consolidate that knowledge into a grammar which allows you to execute lots of things with a framework that's well established, just like English, we have words, we have rules for putting them together, and then you can say anything and it's still in English. There are, there are grammars that characterize um, Palladian architecture. So you can make a house that's a Palladian, uh, that looks like Andrea Palladio built it, or Frank Lloyd Wright built it. But that can easily be applied to fashion as well when you start to develop the grammar that characterizes how these pieces go together and how they sum to create what are uh, more complete and more expressive, uh, uh, well, expressions of, of an idea. That's so interesting. Maybe we should do a story about what fashion can learn from architecture. That's, that's right. Uh, fashion is architecture you wear. That's true. Chris Bevins, can you tell us a bit about how you use technology in the design process? I know you're really passionate about your fabrications, and uh, we were speaking before about the really interesting sort of capabilities you have with your with your factory. Can you tell us about how you're thinking about those things? Yeah, <clears throat> I just want to touch on on the AI. Real yeah, please too, do. Because um, as a small brand, um, we use uh, Springbot that works with Shopify and Facebook and um, um, Instagram and uh, it kind of allows me to kind of regather all this data and really target um, our, our, our base and who, who, who's really supporting us so I can be very uh, strategic on my advertising and where I put my dollars to and that's a $750 a month subscription that I have that's affordable for an emerging brand and can and does a lot of good for us and since I really engaged it my um, I've seen a 95% a growth um, in, in, our, tra in our, our, our traffic um, and, our, and our e com has, has definitely uh, uh, grown quite a bit as well. So I'm you know, just sharing that because there's a lot of students here that eventually one day are going to want, probably want to do their own thing. And there's a very efficient ways that you can, you can uh, target your, your base. So that, I just wanted to throw that out. Was there something surprising that you learned through Springbot about your consumer that you, that you didn't know before? Um, the age, the demographic there. I thought we, I would, we were skewing younger when we really started to look at who, who, who was really shopping with us. Uh, it's the 30 plus that we've seen, you know? So I'm 
was it is it the whole range that was uh the range so the top end and the bottom end were much mm -hmm. uh further apart than you realized completely and i was wasting money so you know and eventually i just talked to the whole world right um but i have to be very specific uh with what, how i spend my my, my budget um, but <clears throat> to go back into what you, you just asked uh factory that i work with um, abroad in taipei has been a great partner using virtual reality uh, to look at my prototypes on a body and have it in motion uh, to see how the garment moves to do a lot of athletic and performance materials which is really important um, <clears throat> so that's been a huge help to us and yesterday I saw that FIT is also using uh, the CAD program that allows you to build the style on body on a digital body which yeah that's browseware browseware right right which is something that we've started to get involved in through this factory as well so it's it's really it's it's amazing and it's efficient so we can we don't have to do multiple prototypes if i want to change a zipper if i want to change a seam i don't have to make a whole new garment that's a waste of fabric a waste of manpower a waste of my money and time um, so that's been a huge, a really, really huge help for us. And I'm just scratching the surface with it. And I know, Michael, you can really educate me a little bit more in this, uh, on that. One it? of the things that's interesting, too, is that once you get through the design process and you sort of have your silhouette, you know what you're working with, you can do development much quicker and offer to the consumer tremendous amount of variations that if you had actually fabricated as prototypes would be prohibitive. But yeah, you can absolutely. iterate through lots of ideas mm -hmm. that way. And then we use a platform called Ord as our showroom. It's a virtual showroom. I try to eliminate as much paper as possible. I don't like to send out paper CADs. It's digital. Uh, Barneys will come in, take a look at the collection. They have their Ord link, and they place their buy that way. And it goes right to us in real time. So trying to find different ways to just be sustainable and efficient um, and we've, we've, we're having a lot of success with that as well, along with utilizing near field communication. I have NFC chips embedded in every garment, which is, has been a lot of fun just experimenting with that. And um, they're waterproof and durable, and it costs me about a dime for each one. I buy them in bulk, and everyone's phone here is NFC enabled. So you could scan a garment, and it can tell you everything about the a to z of the garment where it started what's the idea i name every garment after scientists mathematician architects um, so it gives you a little bit of a backstory about this specific garment um, the attributes of the materials where i source it from um, and then we're taking it even further because uh, you could point your your nfc chip the, the back end to our shopify so i can scan the garment and you can double click with your Apple Pay. Um, so just trying to show retailers a different way of doing business at, at the same time and trying to build a community around it as well. And I, I think just to get on the, the VR thing, because um, one of the things that um, we're looking at um, within H&M uh, to in realizing that a lot of um, issues that we want to tackle, whether that's um, things like uh, shape and size of our clothing, uh, which is an issue. Like we need to do a lot better at like making sure that we actually embrace all kinds of bodies. Um, and sustainability, a lot of that happens at the, that we can use, and we are looking at using um, VR um, to essentially help designers in a very sort of subtle way when they pick fabrics it will show how much water that fabric uses and the amount of carbon. And then also uh, when they're doing uh, the sort of virtual cut of the thing, looking at how it would fit on different shapes of people. And what's really interesting is when you look at these little experiments that we've done, it really influences um, you know, how a product is made when that information is actually made available. Um, and the, the other thing that I just wanted to touch on for, because you know, I've talked about big giant you know, H&M, but what's really cool about, um, I think, the future of um, sort of data and AI, particularly for you know, young and independent designers, is that actually if we use it properly, it, won't, it will 
help diversify the design market, I think, because one of the historic challenges that a lot of um, young and small independent designers have, you know, beyond actually just the inventory issue of actually, you know, having to, to order stuff is, um, you know, finding their customer. And if you make something that you like, chances are there are people all around the world that have the same taste and style that you have, even if it's very niche. And, you know, it might not sell particularly well in one city if it was in one physical store, but if you take, you know, there's profits and niches all around the world. And, like, using AI, and this is something that I really want to, you know, start exploring. It's on my to-do list. I have a long to-do list. But one of the things that I really want to, you know, start exploring is, like, how can we sort of use AI to enhance creative diversity in the fashion market and help um, young and up and up and coming designers find their niche, even if that's a scattered niche all around the world, because collectively that's a lot of people potentially. Uh, and, and building profitable brands that otherwise wouldn't be possible in the traditional sort of buying and selling model that fashion currently uses. It's not, it's, not, it's not all about, it's not uh, AI versus creativity. I think AI can really, really, really be a platform for human creativity if used properly. And understanding behavior on a slightly different scale than what you were talking about, the, one of the um, other aspects of the project we did with Tommy Hilfiger was to look at social media and see where influencers, it was a deep a social media listening tool that we used. And in doing that, we discovered that K-pop bands were influencing the buying of... Oh my God, I've literally just been looking at K-pop. Yes. Like, <laughs> they were influencing the buying of Tommy Hilfiger in Thailand far more than anywhere else in the world. And that they realized that, well, why are we shipping it to Minneapolis? They're buying it like crazy in Thailand. So insights were garnered through this deep analysis and, and listening. And uh, XTC... I literally was, just uh, had a meeting about K-pop. That's so <laughs> funny. Yeah. And it's more sustainable that you save on shipping costs. As Absolutely, well. it made a big difference in the supply chain analysis. Um, Speaking of supply chain, Michael, will you tell us about the brand you're starting with uh, FIT and the on-demand manufacturing? Sure. So that's uh, a, a project we have underway in the lab, and we're launching a brand um, that's uh, FIT designers uh, designed products designed by FIT designers, marketed in retail by students using um, on-demand, made-to-measure manufacturing. Um, we have uh, two lines coming out. One is a, a, a affordable luxury, and another one is a line of basics. Um, and they're gonna, the line of basics is going to be manufactured by a really innovative company in Florence, Alabama, that has an unusual fit engine that is built into their manufacturing technology that uses height, weight, size, and an allowance for bust, and will fit to a very high degree of satisfaction on the people who wear it. So we're going to be doing the basics through a, that company, and then the affordable luxury will be done. There are going to be limited editions um, and uh, developed with a company in New Jersey that uh, also has an innovative manufacturing technique. And with them, we're going to be experimenting with different um, uh, technologies to uh, to do fit, really, to do the on-demand uh, made to measure. And the whole idea of the lab is to create a living, the, the label is to create a living laboratory to experiment with emerging technology and see how it can be benefit, particularly emerging designers. Um, but it's a living laboratory to test out emerging technology across the entire value chain. What's That's it so called? Fun. It's called RD1. And well, it's RD, it's a system, um, and it's based on the idea that it's research and development. And then the first line will be one, the second line will be two, and so on. So it will, it, it'll change each year that we launch uh, with new students. That's cool. That's very exciting. And then I think last thing before we go to questions, Chris Bevins, you mentioned before that um, you had been having, you know, that you started sewing and that you've been having trouble finding sewers. Michael, you said that as well. We've been talking about all these very high-tech, future-looking things, but for the students in the audience, there is still value in some of those traditional skills, right? Can you, can you talk about that? Just fundamental, you know, knowing how to, to, to put the garment together. That's how I learned. My grandmother, she had a, a, a seam, she was a dressmaker here in the city, um, came from Jamaica in the 60s. And um, I, I learned how to sew at a very young age. 
it was really I was really motivated because I I just wanted to make my own stuff really, and I was a tennis player, so I was always trying to make a cool tennis outfit and shorts, and then my pants I was trying to make break dance pants and all sorts of stuff, you know, um, gluing sequences on dinner gloves, like it it, it was all crazy stuff, um, but. My dad would said, like, if the if the sky falls tomorrow, you got to have a talent, be able to do something with your hands, and be able to make something. And uh, he was a Kodak. He was an Eastman Kodaker upstate New York, and he was a camera designer and designed actually the disc camera. Um, I don't know if you guys know the disc camera. It's a revolutionary digital kind of early digital camera. Um, and we I was always around fabric and, and sewing machines and even the foot pedal kicking machine, the old singer, like, and it just, the patience that it t takes to, to, to put something together, to build a garment and- Skill and concentration and focus. Laser. Yeah. Um, Different kind of laser. Yeah. yeah. And so, <laughs> and it kind of goes with my personality, you know, I, I take my time and I was been reading Steve Jobs' book and how he looked at building the computer, the Apple, from the inside out. You might not see it in the inside, but it's got to look beautiful. And I always took that approach. And sewing was that for me. Is the seams have to look have to fall a certain way. And <clears throat> as I traveled the world and, and going to different factories, you have a there's a special connection that you you have with with the sewing machine operators on the floor, when you could sit there and you can talk about the machine. I've even showed them the techniques because sometimes my technical packages don't convey the seam or the direction I want it to go. So you, when you're able to demonstrate that there, you really have, a, you have an amazing connection with someone that you might not speak the language. Um, and when your garment comes down the line, they're going to remember you, and there's, you get an extra little. You get some extra love, and it's 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 serious. When it's when it's time to go to production, and you're making thousands of garments that same style, it's kind of mundane, but the the love is there, and it gives you some flexibility on your FOB prices too. <laughs> and I think it's yeah. interesting too that you know with you might think that all seams are standard, but they're not. And you were looking for a particular kind of seam. And it's hard to convey, but if it's not executed correctly, it's not really fulfilling the design objective. I'm de I'm dealing with an issue right now. I have a garment that the seam didn't fall right, and it's a workout shirt. And I had a very funny email from a customer that said my nipples are chafed because the seam it goes across my apex. So I'm like, we had a laugh, and I had to take care I, of that. I hate it when I chafe my nipples. Is, don't you? <laughs> They do have pads. How for that. come, Chris? I knew you're gonna run with that one. Um, but those things matter. You know, they really matter. That's a return that I have to, you know, I have to take care of. I'm, I'm a small brand out of Portland, Oregon. Every customer really, really matters to us, and we get to know our 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 base and our our fans and our you know those that are supporting us. Um, so we take that you know that that data very serious, and you know I have to raise that seam, and I actually. I, I caught that because it happened to me as well. So I raised the seam an inch and a half. So now it's where it's supposed to be. And I sent out the, the garment to, to our, you know, our customer in, um, in San Francisco. And he was so grateful. Now I have a, a, a customer for, you know, for as long as I'm doing this. So um, that pays off later. It does. It does. Service. It does. Um, and so there's, there's new, there's a lot of new technologies that are out there for, for, Garment construction, you know, sonic welding and bonding, and um, no sew technology. We do we work closely with Bemis on on those techniques. Um, I'm learning a lot right now, and um, but there's nothing like you know good old fashioned uh, sewing machine and, and having the know how of how to just put it together. It really allows a much more freedom with individual expression. Um, Absolutely. Because if you're using the same seam that everybody else is using, it's hard to differentiate. But if you're able to actually introduce new ideas and new directions, you're really able to add that personal touch, which is differentiating. So true. So true.